I'm going to find your body and then I'm going to burn it. And if you're lucky, that's all I'm going to do to it. You feel me? Okay. It seems I was wrong. You're not ready to sit with the big boys. It's back to the kitty table for us too. We have no idea what's going on, but we're gonna try. Here's our breakdown of Legion season two, episode seven. Now, before we get started, make sure you hit that subscribe button where we got you covered for movie reviews, including Solo and Deadpool 2, and TV breakdowns on Westworld season two. What's going on with Bernard? Is he, is it Arnold? Wait, which, one's, which one's Bernard? Bernard's the black guy. Oh, okay. Wait. Right off the bat, John Hamm returns finally after Thank missing you, us. John Hamm. Good to have you back. Yes, and this week it's all about moral panic. And this moral panic is a feeling of fear spread among a large number of people that some evil threatens the well being of society. And a couple of creative ways that they showed these examples in the show was uh, obviously the witch hunts that occurred early in our history in the United States, and also the um, Senate committee hearings on uh, juvenile delinquency in like the 1950s. And that specifically touched on comic books. So it was cool to see some comic books behind um, them and the devil with yellow eyes. This concern, limited at first, spreads from person to person. And that moral panic spreads to Division Three, yep. literally in the form of the egg that we saw every week. It gets in their minds, in their sleep. Yeah, how was that? Waking up to just having uh, you know a broken eggshell next to your dresser. Uh, what no one is noticed going these. on? Again, the slime now. Like no one noticed that at the beginning. Not a Vermillion's like, oh, let me clean this up and figure out where it's going. Nothing. Now in season one, the overarching theme was the madness of the individual, specifically David. Yes. And now in season two, obviously it's now the madness of the crowd. So that's why we're seeing this delusion spread throughout all the characters that we've been following and basically them on the verge of going insane. And later on in the, in the you know, episode, we will almost see that, so. Yeah, it's a little meta too. It's also us, the audience, uh, going as, as the crowd mad. going insane, yeah. yeah. You're upset, Paolo. Use your words. And then once again, we get a showdown between David and Farouk. Well, not really a showdown, they're just sitting at the dinner table. And to be honest, I'm a little bit burnt out of these kind of meetups on the astral plane between these two because it's kind of the same thing over and over again. Farouk explains and tries to convince David to, you know, show his face, reveal his, take off his mask and, you know, you're a god, use all the powers you can and do whatever you want. And David's like, nah, dude, I'm actually a good guy. I don't want to do that. It's, it's just a, it's back, back and, and forth, forth yeah. and nothing really manifests out of any of this. It's like... Why not just attack him right now? Why not try to kill him, David? I dig it. I, I dig those scenes a lot. But yeah, at the same time, he just killed your sister. And yeah. <laughs> you have him face to face. And we saw already in the first episode of this season that they can fight and battle in the astral yeah. plane in some way. He could have fought him right then and there. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I, the only thing I can come back to saying is maybe Farouk is more powerful than we first suspected. Oh, I'm sure I mean, he, he is. literally, you know, snaps and sends David off to a kiddie table, like, yeah. like he said. Um, Ovita oh, Zen, I thought right then and there, oh, he's just gonna like snap him out of existence. He's gonna Thanos him or something. Right. Uh, it, it didn't happen. I feel like Farouk is a lot more powerful uh, than David, and even the show itself is not giving away his full potential of power yet. Totally agree. I just, the tease is just killing me. Like, it I is. wanna see some actual stuff go down, Oof. and it, it's just like they're, te they're almost like flirting with each other, and they're never going to like just move past it and just like handle business. See you in the season finale. That's what they're telling us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then next up, we find out that Farouk can also travel through time, which isn't far-fetched at all after what we saw what David did. Um, but the way they travel through time is a little interesting. This time around. Very interesting, yeah. It's just like Noah Hawley, it's to totally Noah Hawley to do this. You know, David's you know <laughs> floating in a bathtub, a circular bathtub that Carrie made and can travel through time like and Xavier. space. He's kind of like doing a whole Xavier thing. With exactly, it. and then now Sweet. for Farouk, he's literally in a car that's plugged into like, a pink slime straight out of Ghostbusters 2. You ignorant, disgusting blob! 
You're nothing but an unstable short chain molecule. You foul, obnoxious mom! The hysterical part is like there's no explanation made at all. Don't like, need it. At least with Carrie, like he explained like what was going on. Like here's why you're gonna float in this water, David, and here's what we're doing. But here it was just like, uh, okay, he's just like gonna just like hotbox himself in a I love car it. with this pink slime and then just evaporate into another time and dimension? Abstract reality, I love it. They're clashing so hard here. It's the astral plane, anything's possible. That's what Farouk's trying to let us know. He believes himself to be a god and he can do whatever he wants and now he's trying to, you know, show that. So Farouk uses that car to travel to meet up with future Sid mm -hmm. and I, I really enjoyed this part of the Me show too. because uh, we never see these two actors in the same room together. We normally get Farouk with David, Lenny, and Oliver, and to get uh, two great actors like this in the same room mm -hmm. um, was awesome. You can't hurt me here. You know that, right? Are you sure? But no, one more. Why will I hurt you? Now, the question I have about that scene, like you just said, he only met with Lenny, Oliver, and David. Mm -hmm. Astral plane. Now, he's talking to Sid. She sees his body. He doesn't have his body yet. Uh, they gotta be in the astral plane, which makes me wonder, what the hell is Sid? What is this room? And does it involve, is he just in her mind too? Or is everyone in this astral plane world brought together by David, maybe? And now you're telling me that the opposite is true. That the villain is a hero. And the hero is the villain. Now, if there's one little criticism I have of Farouk, it's the kind of his over-reliance on using this white man with blue eyes in colonists coming for his crown. I understand we're supposed to sympathize with him and that's something that I could get behind, but he's also done a lot of horrific things to people on this show. Each episode. Each episode. <laughs> like, just like, you know, mutilating bodies, killing people, like innocent people, like, I'm, I'm supposed to root for you, but, you know, how can I after I've seen you do all these horrible things to people? Maybe we're all villain villains. They have a great conversation of heroes and villains and which who's who mm -hmm. and you know they never confirm that they're talking about David but they heavily allude to the fact yeah. that David is the one that needs to be stopped in the future from this catastrophic event. If you take it at face value they even show you David a quick shot of David before they before that reveal from Farouk like oh him now there could be some trickery going on here but right now you should take it as it's David that's causing these events which is what we thought from the beginning. Now, a fun part we gotta talk about is the conversation that David has with current Sid about laying the ground rules for their relationship and when it comes to future Sid. Yeah? It's like, how do you deal with future girlfriend and your interactions with them? I thought that was cool. I thought it was fun too. It grounds this conversation, it grounds the story. It's a conversation that you'd think that any boyfriend, girlfriend, significant others would have with one another. Mm -hmm. It's just funny when it's happening with a future version of one person. He can talk to her if she needs a hug or something. I know it doesn't make sense, but... Um, it's, it's how you feel. Now, the one part that didn't work for me was Future Sid and David, all their previous interactions, there were never any sexual overtones throughout any of them. And then that one time after this conversation, after Future Sid meets with Farouk, then she's totally coming on to David. I thought that, uh, you know, David would recognize that and would kind of be like, whoa, 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 what's yeah. going on? Uh, you know, there's some ulterior motives here. Uh, you know, it just kind of came out of the blue and I think that you would be able to notice that in a person if they were trying to get something out of you. That's true, but at the same time, I don't know how long she's been there by herself. She could just be lonely, dude. Good point. Also, again, this confirms that they're in the astral plane of some kind because he kisses her and obviously they can't touch each other in the real world. So it's Easter day at Division 3. Oh God. Yep, there are eggs hidden throughout Division 3, but this problem is that insanity hatched out of all of them. Yes. Also, shout out to the Vermilion for that awesome, like, Charlie's Angels pose they did. Yeah, the Vermilion stopped moving as soon as Clark turns around in the hallway, and then he would walk a little bit farther, and then they'd be in a different pose a little bit closer. 
you know, it's a fun trope that we've seen throughout TV and movies. Yeah, it's a fun little nod to one of my favorite villains in Doctor Who, the Weeping Angels. So a fun little showdown between Carrie, Potonomy, and the Vermilion. You know, they're attacking those two because they're infected with the insanity bugs in okay. their foreheads. And then they try to kill the Admiral Fukuyama, but David comes in and stops them. I like how he just changes the gun to a mop. He's literally cleaning up the mess, right? He's cleaning, yeah, he's cleaning up the mess in there. I like that. And then he um, like freezes them as well. What are you doing? So David stops everything except for one last insanity chicken spider bug that rips through Potonomy because I think that basically it's been there longer than everyone else's. Yeah, it's the first one we saw it, so it's grown to its adult form. Yeah, it's, it's huge <laughs> and it rips through Potonomy and then just books it out of the room. Metal. So Potonomy's body's gone now, or he, they, they treat him or something, and uh, he's digitally uploaded his mind into the mainframe. <laughs> Yeah, the tree matrix. With a old knitting granny in a chair. I have no idea who the knitting granny is. One thing I will say though, is it's pretty fitting for the guy with the perfect memory that never forgets anything, is now a part of a computer, like the internals of a computer. Yeah, there's a lot more going on with Potonomy than we think. Um, there's a bigger goal here, I think, with Fukuyama than just uploading Potonomy as a random guy. Oh, he's dying, let's put him in the mainframe. I think there's more here. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a vital component. I think uh, you take someone who can remember everything. everything, and then someone who sees everything, and now those two can work together on something. One plus there's, one. Yeah, there's definitely, that's definitely a, a powerful weapon to use down the road for, uh, against someone. Ryan, let's jump into favorite moments. What do you got? Uh, my two favorite moments, I have two of them, sorry. It's instances where David used his powers to show how, how powerful of a mutant he is. Uh, the first one when he you know, transported back into Division Three. Mm -hmm and turned Clark's gun into a mop. Thought it was awesome, just instantaneously. And then uh, when he defeated that insect, insanity bug chicken thing, uh, you know, it was this large, grotesque, uh, huge thing that was running through the halls of yeah. Division Three, And he pulled them into a giant red room and- Green shirt. Outgrew him and uh, then just put him into a nice little jar. That was an awesome way to represent the powers that David has. And instead of him just, you know, snapping and destroying the thing, it was a, a fun little standoff. Also represented to the hero-villain complex they talked about in this whole entire episode. Who's the hero, who's the villain? And at the very end, they have it clash, and now you're like, oh, well, David's obviously gonna become some kind of villain this season, but we'll see. I thought it was funny too that he's kind of like, you know, trying to talk with the, the, with the insanity yeah. bug, like he's trying to have a little like he hesitated on killing him at first, and he's like, "Hey man, can you just like do me a favor and like just 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 feel me out here? Like I'm going through a lot of shit. Like I have to deal with the Shadow King. Can you just be understandable?" All right, so I love David's powers manifested in this episode. Uh, what was your favorite moment? Well, when Farouk uses his powers, I mean, he literally sends David to the kitty table. <laughs> Come on, that was awesome. Get set, off with us. Go. We can't grasp just yet how powerful Farouk is, and every week they give us a little hint. Like he's, yeah. he's world breaker power, we're gonna find out later on. We just don't know if David's gonna stop him. Totally, I, and I loved how, I mean, he is an incredible villain. You know, he has the, the charisma, he is obviously uh, just uh, does horrific things, but he also is a funny a guy with a sense of humor. Yeah. The way that he's literally toying with David. He even has Amy reappear there and laugh in his face. It's complete like taunting. He's like trolling him on a whole nother level. <laughs> Stop it. Time now for some final thoughts, theories, questions, mainly just questions though, I think. A lot. Um, number one for me, is that thing a chicken, a spider, a bug, an insect, a bird? Minotaur. Wait, what, thing? what the hell is it? And then who sent these bugs? Is it Farouk? I mean, Lenny had the little bug in one of the montages. Could it be Admiral Fukuyama still somehow, some way? Uh, I'm, I'm leaning towards it being Farouk and he's using this as a distraction 
mm. for David. The song they play outside the hostage crisis. Yes. I have a question, like, they just let the bug roam around Division 3. Just like, you know, what was it looking for? And why didn't David just like, boom, kill it right there? Just spray some raid on it immediately. CG team, they just wanted to show that, you know, show them crawling through the hall. Put all their money into that sequence. They're just like, come on, let, it, let, us, let, us, let us show the CG. Maybe. Okay, who is the knitting granny? This one totally threw me for a loop. I thought at first it was someone that Patanami knew, his mother, a grandmother, someone from his past, but mm. I don't know why, why she would even be up there. Um, I can only think it would be someone else who was uploaded to the mainframe years, decades before. Still don't know who the granny is. I think next week we're gonna find out a little bit more on, on who she is and what she's doing up there in the tree matrix. You know who I miss is Melanie Bird. Uh, you know, she was infected we saw earlier on. Um, we even yeah. saw the Minotaur walking by her at certain points, points when she was getting high. Jean Smart is such an amazing actor and I can't believe they're not using her. Now that you said that, I feel like in a few episodes down the line, there's gonna be an entire episode dedicated to her. I hope so, I hope so. Maybe, you know, her and Oliver and Oliver's motivation to get oh, yeah. back to Division Three mm -hmm. and get back with her. Um, I, I hope to see her because I just, she's an amazing talent and to not use her in this show is a travesty. Okay, a couple theories to leave you with. Uh, all right, here's a crazy theory I'm gonna throw at the wall right now. Again, about the astral plane in the future. Is it all a part of David's massive brain? <laughs> is this all in his mind in the future where he killed everyone and trapped them in the astral plane? That's definitely a possibility, right? He can create his own reality. He can control a number of people and personalities. If the only safe place for people to live in the future would be inside of his own brain, that, that might happen. But at the same time, if you're looking at this room and how there's glitching out, the neon lights, and where do we see these colors before with the vermilion and this whole now mainframe thing makes me wonder if these people are trapped in some world that Patonomy has created. Maybe he's the villain here. Wow. Dun dun dun. All right, I'll give you another crazy theory. I don't think Farouk is even looking for his own body. There is no body? There is no body. It's just to throw us off the scent. I think he just wants to be back in David's body. I think he's literally spent so much time in David's body, it has become his own. I don't think he needs his old body. I think David's body and mind is more powerful. And I think he's trying to use David against himself to keep him on his toes, to keep him unstable, to keep him angry, to keep him untrustworthy of other people close to him. And I think his ultimate plan is to get back into David's body and then use that vessel to find Charles Xavier. <laughs> I'm coming for you. And then again, John Hamm's narrated lectures, they're obviously linked in some way to Farouk. Well, every single episode. Um, now, is Farouk the one in charge of all this? Is he really just the big bad the entire time and everything else is just delusion, all stuff to get us off track? What's more terrifying? Fear or the frightened? I can't imagine they would have John Hamm here doing this narration and then there's not some kind of twist reveal at the end. Yeah, I think there's definitely a tie-in. I, I agree with you. I don't know how so, but we, we, it sounds like John Hamm and his narrated parts are a lecture of sorts, you know, a classroom filled with people that he's teaching all of these, uh, you know, anecdotes about, uh, you know, personalities and people going mad and insanity and delusion and conflict and everything. I just think that it's all tied together to make one big lecture, one big uh, uh, teaching, one big lesson. But who is he teaching this to? And who is he speaking to besides us, the audience, obviously? Um, there might be some big reveal at the end where we, we find out that the Shadow King is controlling all of that. Okay, everyone, that's it for us over here. Let us know what your big theories are in the comment section down below. And make sure you come back next week. We'll be breaking down episode eight of Legion season two. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye. Your boyfriend is an extremely powerful mutant who could destroy the world if he wanted to. Or if, say, you hurt his feelings real bad. We just need to find the body and finish this thing. I'm going after him. Love is what we have to save if we're gonna save the world. I'm just not sure that's what he's doing.